Welcome to With Winning in Mind. I'm Heather Sumlin, and I'm here with... Troy Basham. Troy is the author of Attainment, the 12 Elements of Elite Performance. He has been working with mental management with our father and our company since 2004. And I thought it'd be good to just kind of get a little background on why you wrote the book, a little more about you, and just kind of give people a chance to get to know you better. You up for it? I'm up for it, sure. Okay, Let's good. Go. Good. Okay, so the first question I have for you is what really led you to want to write a book? It's really hard. I know it's hard to write a book because I have yet to do it. And part of it is because with Winning in Mind, our dad's book has basically the foundation of our of our business and of our company and it's a really great read and um, to write something for the company is really hard to do so tell me what led you to choose to write it and how did you determine what to write about so years ago when I first came on board probably 06 maybe you know a couple years in the company part of my job was traveling with with dad Mm -hmm. You know, our dad did not want to travel anymore by himself. He's like, look. And uh, another thing is that he wanted someone else to relieve him some stuff. So when you travel and you're doing speeches, someone's got to sell product. So Mm -hmm. it was either you or me going. And so I went and started doing a lot with that. And, you know, one day he's like, you know, you need to write a book. And I'm like, what am I going to write a book on? And so I discovered that. He kept hitting this, hitting this, and I discovered in my mind that, you know, I probably need to do this. It's like I, I need to kind of, you know, put something on paper. And so I started writing a book, and I got three chapters in. I'm like, okay, this is I, – I like where this is going. So I printed it out. We're going on a, on a flight, and then I handed it to Dad to read. I said, here, read this time what you think. And so he's reading on the plane, and, he, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty good, and he handed it to me. And to me, that was his way of saying, yeah, that's not good. It wasn't like he didn't ask me questions about it. He didn't say it was great. He said, yeah, pretty good. And he handed it to me. And I'm like, yeah, that's not going to work. And so then I'm like, okay, so I'm, I'm doing this kind of self-discovery of what I'm going to write about, what I'm going to get, how am I going to do this, and not repeat with winning in mind. Right. You know, because growing up, we were taught the principles growing up. So to us, a lot of this is just common sense. It's stuff that we mm-hmm. kind of know. I don't want to share the same stories, but the same token – you don't know if someone's going to read this first or read with winning mind first. So I'm like, hey, what can I bring that's a little different? And so I decided, okay, we grew up looking at our dad teaching, you know, these different athletes coming in. You know, they weren't just all rifle shooters at the International Shooting School. Dad was teaching mental management, and people would come in and all walks of life in all different sports, and a lot of these guys were top performers in their sport they were the five percent mm-hmm. or they became the five percent and you started to notice okay there's something that's common among these people and so i'm like okay what do all of these guys have in common so i went back and started looking at these individuals you know some of them we grew up we know we still mm-hmm. communicate with some of them and it's like okay they they're all passionate about their sport it's not like they don't like to do it no they love to do it you know, most people like to do stuff, but being passionate is beyond that. And they all had that. And then, you know, they all had a mental game. There's, you know, second to none. They had the self-image that they're going to win. You know, these things just started popping into my head like, okay. And I came down with five main things that all the five percenters have. Mm-hmm. Within that, there's these elements, as I call them, just it kind of separates the elite from the other performers. Mm-hmm. It, you don't have to be an elite level athlete to win at the elite level there are examples of people that pop up and they win you're going to have someone that's going to come out of nowhere and they're going to win the gold medal I'm like okay they haven't won anything but they just won the olympics you know how do they they do that well because they're really good mm-hmm. but the ones who are winning and continue to win and win the olympics and they got all these you know medals and trophies and records like a consistent international competitor that's always on the podium yeah Mm -hmm. people that are gonna yeah they're gonna be here next time Mm -hmm. they're gonna be here next time they are the creams of cream type of people Mm -hmm. they're the top five percenters they show up day in day out and they're competitive they're gonna be there and they do most of the winning and so you start seeing a little differences and that's what i call elements so they'll have five main things and then there's these elements with 
you know, that kind of sprinkle through the book that just kind of differentiate the top 5% from the other competitors. And when I say other competitors, I'm talking about really good competitors. These are advanced athletes mm-hmm. in their sport. And then there's a couple of stories that I'm like, why doesn't dad put that into any of his you know, books? That I mean, he's written a few books. He's mm-hmm. had many different products, whether it's on audio or video. And he didn't share, he never shared the Michael Gross story. He never mm-hmm. shared Carly Taka's story. I'm like, how can you not put those two stories? And I'm like, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to do it. And so they just kind of fit with a couple of things that I was talking about. And so then I said, okay, I'm going to write it like that. And so it was a different angle. And then three years later, I had a manuscript that, you know, dad actually liked. He's like, okay, this is good. This is like really good. You know, when he says it's really good versus pretty good, that means, okay, it passes the sniff test <laughs> for him. And then, you know, we saw published it and ordered 3,000 copies. So that was a big self-image boost that, you know, mm-hmm. he's ordering 3,000 copies. I don't think people realize that 99% of books that are written mm-hmm. sell less than 1,000 copies. Exactly. So for him to order 3,000 was was kind of impressive. And we've reordered since then, and it's done pretty good. We just reordered again. Yeah, yeah done pretty good. So the feedback we get is really, really good. So it makes you, you know, pretty happy and that kind of stuff. And then, you know, then I got motivated a few years later to write, you know, a golf book. And then after writing that one, it took three years to write that one. And I'm like, yeah, writing a book is hard. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about your golf book for just a second. Because For the Mind, the mental program for golf – to me, it's so genius. And I don't golf. Like, I knew nothing about golf at all. But I enjoyed reading it. And I enjoyed because you decided to make it a story instead of making it like this self helpy feeling, nonfiction kind of book. You decided to make it a fictional story with real content and meat. So something that it doesn't matter what level you are. You could be a junior golfer. You could be a pro. You could be a, a, a coach even. And you're going to be able to understand what the mental program for golf is and how to apply it and the steps that you take. But you're going to enjoy reading it because you're going to follow this character too. So, wh- okay, how'd you come up with that idea? On the on the golf book, like to make the, it a story instead of what we've always done is more of the nonfiction self help, and this one seems a little different. Well, I wanted to do a golf book. Because dad wasn't going to do a golf product, I don't think. He wasn't going to write a golf book. So I'm like, I'm going to do a golf book. So I'm going to mm-hmm. come up with something. Well, I didn't want to do what I did with attainment. Because then I didn't want people to look at this. Oh, well, you just golfinized what you did in your, your f- previous book. So I didn't want to do that. And so I started thinking, okay, what would I do? And then what am I going to talk about? Everyone talks about pre-shot routine. Mm-hmm. But no one defines what that means. So we define this preload mental program, and I'm like, what if I take a, a story and there's a person that's teaching someone how to do these mental steps in their routine in golf, and I make it to where each step they start to progress and progress, and then they become this champion that they're trying to become. That was kind of the story. But you need a, a main character. You need kind of like the, the Yoda, the the. The guy that produces the stuff. The Yoda best. Yeah. Yes. You need that. And so I try to come up with a hook. So I've got this player that, you know, just, I don't know how I came up with the name Kevin. I just, Kevin popped in my head. I'm like, okay, that's going to be the name of the character. His uncle's going to be the one that's, you know, writing these letters, which are basically lessons that he's going to sneak in his bag. And so he shows up to the golf course with his caddy to prepare for a tournament that week. And he reaches in to get his golf glove and there's a, envelope and he Mm -hmm. opens up and there's a letter in there and it's explaining something and Mm -hmm. he's like wait a minute this this is kind of kind of neat we we need to look at this Mm -hmm. and his caddy looks at it he's like okay so let's talk about it and then they start implementing this and then every you know week or so they get a new letter a new letter and they didn't have a clue where this was coming from so i kind of wanted to keep a surprise at the end to (laughs) where you know, the player would find out who it is, and then there's a little bit of a um, of a of a hook in there, if you mm-hmm. will, on where the uncle got the information from. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to make it a story where someone's going to want to keep reading it 
not just for the content, but for the storyline. Mm -hmm. And it's in third person as opposed to first person, which is what attainment is. And I would tell you, it's much more difficult to write <laughs> third person than it is in first person. I'll tell you, if you ever want to write a book, just do it first person. That's my, <laughs> that's my suggestion. Because my idea was I was going to do a three-part series. I haven't gotten to the second part. <laughs> so if I've been thinking about writing another book, but it's going to be more like a tame at first person type of mm -hmm. style and that one it was just a new challenge it was more golf specific and i th you know we look at a lot of books on the middle game there are a lot of what there's not much how mm -hmm. and i wanted that book to be how so that's why i wrote it so when you look at okay there's 12 elements in here if you were to write a sequel to attainment mm -hmm. Can you think of, and I might be putting you on the spot, but can you think of it something that's not in here that you now wish was? The 13th element. Yeah, what's the 13th element? Ooh, that could be its own book. Yeah. What is it? It would all, it would all be tied to self-image. Mm -hmm. it, would, it would take the last chapter and go more in depth with it because the self-image is really the main difference between what separates the really, really good from mm -hmm. the rest of the pack. I mean, your superstars, self-image is equal to the skill level. It's not overinflated. It's the same size. So I would, I would go in that direction if I was going to do a sequel to that book. The other thing I would do is I would probably bring more stories of people that I've worked with, you've worked with, dad's worked with, people that we personally know. Mm -hmm. Because I think there's a lot of really top champions in sport that aren't mainstream, but they're really cool stories. Mm -hmm. And people just don't know about it because it's a lesser sport that a lot of people aren't inter interested in or they don't know about or it's not televised. And they're like, wow, I didn't know this guy did this stuff. Put the story of uh, Night Train Lane in there because when I was doing some research, I came up with a story, you know, I read this article, came across this article, and it was about this guy, you know, Night Train Lane. I'm like, mm -hmm. Who is this guy? And then you find out they changed the rules in the NFL because the guy was so good. But here's a guy that wasn't drafted. He basically mm. walked on and said, I want to try out. Mm. And he makes a team. He becomes one of the most dominant players at his position. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this hits one of the five things that, you know, I was talking about in the book. So I'm like, okay, I don't know him personally or, you know, I just came across the article. And I'm like, yeah, we need – to be remembered of those things and people can relate to football you can go in the past a lot of people who are big into football probably know who that guy is but people like me that are you know not old school football you know i grew up in the pretty much the 80s so mm -hmm. i don't know before then like a lot of people then you look at other sports like rifle shooting that we a lot of tons of shooting sports Nobody knows about these mm -hmm. superstars, right? Now, within the sport, oh, yeah, everyone knows about them. But, I mean, we've come across people that have been, you know, in multiple sports that you're just like, that guy is dominant. Mm -hmm. Whether it's in billiards, whether it's in, in bowling, whether it's in table tennis, they're just not mainstream. And so I'm like, yeah, I would like to put some of those stories in kind of a sequel version to attainment. I might like to work with you on that project. Yeah, if that's what we're gonna have to do, get you get a book. Yeah, probably, probably. I'm happy to help you write it. <laughs> so I, when I'm looking through this, I think so. In the back of the book, for those of you who haven't read it but will be reading it soon, in the back you explain you have like a, a cheat sheet for all your elements. And my favorite one, we're talking about self image, and my personal favorite one is elite performers actively build and protect their self image. Others fail to realize the importance of building and protecting their self-image. Why is it, in your opinion, that so few people really understand the value of building and protecting self-image? They just not realize how to do it, why it's important. They don't know what the self-image is. Is it a lack of understanding? What is it? All those things. The first thing is most people don't understand self-image. The reason why is because if you look at most mental uh, coaches, for example, their model doesn't have self-image in it. Mm -hmm. It's the the conscious, subconscious equals performance, the, the thinker, the doer kind of thing. The self-image is 
in my opinion, I've said this many times, that the genius of what our father came up with was the performance model. Showing the relationship between conscious, subconscious, self-image was a game changer. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it and you understand how they work together, you realize that the big key to unlock everything is the self-image. There are people that believe that you either have confidence or you don't. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you can teach. Well, we know that's not true. You can build someone's confidence. Now, you can do it falsely or you can do it accurately, which leads to the second thing. Once people understand what self-image is, they don't understand how to properly build self-image. There are examples of people who falsely build self-image. Yeah, I call it, I joke, I call it the American Auto effect. You remember uh-huh. American Auto came out years ago? Yes. The very first season, there was this girl that was just excited to be there. And I mean, the motivation was pretty impressive, right? She was like, oh, I'm so excited, I'm so excited. Why are you here? And she goes, because I can sing. And he goes, all right, who said you could sing? And she goes, my mama said I could sing. And well, sing, we, we can't wait. And she sings, and then Simon Cowell stops her midway and says, your mama lied, you can't sing. Mm-hmm. Well, that's an example of someone falsely propping up mm-hmm. this person's confidence. So they had a false self-image of who they were. That's not what we want. We want a self-image that's being built correctly so when praise is warranted praise somebody Mm -hmm. but when it's not warranted don't praise them when it's not warranted but help them find solutions correct but if you don't understand self-image and you don't Mm -hmm. understand how to build self-image then it's going to be very hard for you to gain confidence in what you're doing right and then the third thing is is i don't think people actively seek out help in that area they they seek out skill you know, I need to get better at what I'm doing from a skill level. And they focus a lot on what they're thinking about. You know, mm-hmm. okay, I need to think a little differently on my attitude towards this or my attitude towards that. But it's not connected to the self-image. And this goes back to the first point is if you don't understand the performance model, you're not going to be able to do that well. So I think that's what what happens to most people is they don't have that. A lot of the elite performers that we find just have it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm convinced that there's about 10% of the population that just got it. Mm-hmm. You know, they look at everyone else like, well, what's your problem? I but, don't understand why you're struggling. Mm-hmm. I think also a lot of competitors end up being really hard on themselves. And then they actually don't realize how damaging that is. And they think, well, but if I push myself, like that's a good thing. And it is, but it can be damaging to self-image if you're hard on yourself and you're breaking yourself down and you're focusing on all the problems and do you find that with some of your athletes when you first start working with them that that's the case a lot of times yeah a lot of times they're going to be beating themselves up because they think the harder i am on myself you know the more i push myself it's kind of an old school mentality it might have worked for for some people in Mm -hmm. the past the but it makes sense why people do it if you look at most people that are hard on themselves they're very competitive they do not like to lose. Right. I mean, we're talking about they hate losing more than they love winning. So <laughs> they're going to be really hard on themselves, mm-hmm. right? But if you don't understand what that potential can do to someone's self-image, it could be destructive to it. So therefore, they're not going to be as confident as they, they need to be in their ability to do something. Or they could risk being overconfident in something, and then they wind up getting beat. And so that kind of happens a lot with with individuals as well. The other thing I'll say is that we live in a society that, you know, focuses on what? The negative or the positive? Oh, the negative almost always. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a few positives. Like, you know, today you you read about the Milwaukee Bucks. You know, they just won the the championship. You know, their best player scored 50 points last night to to win the the championships. And they're talking about that performance and that they won. And, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's awesome. Right. But you have a lot more articles talking about why this team didn't win or this person failed. Mm-hmm. You know, just look at the news. They never talk about people getting home safely. They're always talking about the people who had accidents. Mm-hmm. So you would think nobody could drive, you know. So sitcoms, how many times are they focusing on a problem versus a solution? You know, and it's more fun, you know, to focus on the on the negative than the, the positive. It's you know, more emotional and exciting to watch when someone's struggling rather than when someone's, you know, doing well. If someone's doing really good all the time, it's kind of boring to watch. You know, you need 
a little bit of hiccups in there. And we tend to focus a lot on that. On that. And then it affects people. And I just think it's part of society we grew up in. I say we grew up in the United States of negativity. So um, what's your favorite element? Oh, that's a hard one. Well, I, I'll give you the PC answer. Hmm. The elements are like my babies. I can't have a favorite. Oh, my goodness. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Well, okay. So let's talk about the difference between attainment and accomplishment. Because that's your, your last element in here. You talk about how um, elite performers focus on attainment and care a lot about attainment while others really focus on accomplishment. Can you explain the difference between the two? So, yeah, when we grew up, it was all about becoming, mm -hmm. not about just accomplishing. Accomplishment is important. That's what everyone looks at in everything. So take sports. It's first, second, or third. So if you win a medal in the Olympics – you won a medal, mm -hmm. you know? Right. So it's like, oh, wow, you won, you got third place, you won a bronze medal, you know? If a guy won a silver medal, you go, oh, wow, you, you beat everybody but one person. And then the gold medal separates himself from everyone else kind of thing. If you're looking at academics, it's mm -hmm. A's, B's, or C's. What's your GPA? Or it's class ranking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're valedictorian, it's like, wow, that guy's super smart. You know, oh, that guy set a world record. He's super good at X or Y. It could be a job title too. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, this guy is... Or how much position. money you make. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's it's tied to something. And it's easy to measure that because I can see mm -hmm. what people are doing. You know? So if it's like in football, why do people think Tom Brady is the GOAT? Mm -hmm. Why do they think that? Well, just look at what he's accomplished. And when you look at what he accomplished, you're like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a good argument to make. Safe bet. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to come up with a really good argument to put somebody else ahead of him, right? Right. But what are they going to do to put things ahead? If they want to bring another quarterback, either in present or past time, and say, no, this guy was better than, than Tom Brady, right? You're going to have to use accomplishments. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same as you go in hockey. They call Wayne Gretzky the great one for a reason. Mm -hmm. Just look at his accomplishments. There are some records that he has that may never be broken. And it's based on, on accomplishment. Attainment goes one step further. We look at, okay, who did you become in the process? Mm -hmm. It's no accident that these people got to be where they were. Michael Jordan got to become Michael Jordan, not because he accomplished great things, because he became a great player mm -hmm. that was able to accomplish things. So becoming is how you measure the internal. It's very hard to see that. You can't, you can't just open someone up and look inside and know what kind of drive they have. You know, uh, are they really taking advantage of what they have in their talent? Mm -hmm. You know, from a from eternal viewpoint, it's hard to see that. Now, maybe, you know, mom and dad might. They know that kid really well. They, oh, no, no, that kid is very self-driven. And they're like, no, they're becoming this and this and this. Okay, but from an outside perspective, if you don't know the person at all, mm -hmm. how do you know if they're becoming great? All you can look at is what, what the accomplishments they've had. And so when you see a lot of people that are going out and scouting athletes, they're scouting athletes and they're trying to see, okay, what can that guy do? But it's accomplished based. If you could tap into the becoming part, it'd make their jobs much easier. But when you look at it from an individual level, becoming is the key thing. If I become a champion, you know, means I adopt the habits and attitudes of what makes a champion a champion, then what do you think may follow? Accomplishment. accomplishment focus on becoming accomplishment follows so attainment is those two things is becoming and accomplishing a lot of people only focus on accomplishment well but, what if you accomplish something but you don't know how you did it you can't repeat it mm -hmm. there's no question that wayne gretzky knows how to win titles mm -hmm. tom brady knows how to win titles michael jordan knows how to win titles mm -hmm. they won multiple Right. Right. So it was like, OK, well, how did you do that? They knew how they did it. And it wasn't based on just accomplishments, you know, and this was all sports. It's, you know, go back when when our dad was competing in the early 70s, he wasn't winning. Now, he was he was in contention to win, mm -hmm. but he wasn't winning in the early 70s. It wasn't until 1974 that he started figuring, oh, wait a minute, if I do this and this, it produces this. Right. And when he started looking at that. And trusted that the accomplishments would follow. Well, accomplishments just came like a rainstorm to him. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it's pretty mind blowing when you see what he accomplished in the 1970s with some of the stuff he had to deal with. And that's the other thing is that people are going to push through because why? They became someone that is like them to do X, Y that produces the accomplishments they want. So that's why I wrote the book Attainment because it was always about, look, seek to become accomplished with followers. You want to be All-American in, in college? Find out what the All-Americans are doing and become that individual. Mm-hmm. And then guess what you're probably going to get? You're probably going to get that or you get close to it for sure. And so that's why I named it Attainment because I wanted to bring that across through it. Plus, I, I just like uh, one title books. I think mm-hmm. they're kind of cool. You know, when you just have one main title and then a subtitle. Mm-hmm. So, because it's easy to remember, you know, attainment. You got to read attainment. It's one word, you know. And how are you going to come up with a cooler title than with winning in mind? Yeah, we can't. No. Dad took the best title ever. Yeah. Yeah. So what's next for you? We're going to work on the book together, apparently. Yeah. Well, I want to come up with a book that's more on training. Mm. So I'm, you have been tasked to do that by some people, I remember. Yeah, we did a webinar, I guess, and somebody's yeah. like, "You need to do one on mm-hmm. our training, like a training to win." We do a training to win webinar, and um, Troy has an online course. It, wait, it's not on an online course yet. No, just on a webinar um, where he dives into training and how to train in order to build self image at the same time you're building skill. It's genius, and we've had several requests for you to put it in print. Yeah. I, I've always thought thought that most people they practice they don't train mm-hmm. or they play they don't train and and maybe practice and training are synonymous but when I look at it I look at it as in when you're training are you actively building and protecting self image at the same time you're working on skill mm-hmm. are you focusing on certain objectives you want to accomplish for that day are you striving to become the person you want that's going to be able to achieve the goals that you have written down whether it's for that year or down in the future. Most people, they show up and they just practice. Now, in team sports, it makes sense because in team sports, what are they doing? They're going by what the coaches are, are telling them. Mm-hmm. So the coaches have all the responsibility you know, to do a lot of the, the work. But it's away from that, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Are you just going and just you know, practicing? Are you actually working on stuff? If you're actually working on stuff and striving to make things happen and there's a reason, there's an objective, there's purpose for it, I'm all for it. I work with a lot of younger athletes, a lot of high school collegiate level athletes. Mm-hmm. I am 100% convinced that the overwhelming majority of them have no clue how to train. They think they do, but but they don't. Is it they don't have any organized plan of what they're going to accomplish that, that day in their training? Yeah, like they'll just... Take a, a junior golfer. They'll mm-hmm. go to the golf course, and then when they get to the golf course, then they start thinking about what they're going to do. Okay, I think I'll go, you know, hit some balls on the driving range, and then I'm going to go putt a little bit, and then I'll, I'll I'll take a lunch break, and then I'll go work on my chipping. And but it's not pre-planned. It's okay. I'm just going to kind of work on this on the fly. They're winging it. Exactly. Mm. Now take someone like I don't remember leaving my house, going to the range, and not knowing what I was going to do. Before I left the house, I never got to the range and thought, okay, what am I going to do first? Am I, am I going to shoot prone? Am I going to do air gun? Am, what, what am I going to do? I already knew before I left the house what I was going to do that day because I had a weekly training plan. Mm-hmm. So already, if somebody, you know, I say, hey, Troy, what are you doing Thursday at, at 1030? I would tell you. I knew exactly what I was doing at 1030 on Thursday because I already had it written out. I knew what I was going to do. You know, and so if you're going to try to win a national championship, how do you expect to do it if you don't have a plan in place? And if you don't follow that training plan, then how do you know if it works or what doesn't work mm-hmm. or what does work? And then how are you going to going to change that? So things like training effect, people don't talk about. You know, people don't talk about training principles and guidelines that work for the majority of people mm-hmm. that help people get better faster. And in my mind, I think it's one of the things that we teach that a lot of people, if you just left it to them individually, they went, yeah, I'm not going to take that course. I know how to train. But we're not coming from, I'm not going to teach you how to hit a golf ball or how to shoot a shotgun or how to play table tennis. Right. Okay, but I can teach you how to train better. You know, we're talking about performance. 
performance is a function of three things. Those three things need to be a, you know, taken care of every day you go and work on mm-hmm. your craft. If you're not focusing correctly, building the conscious, if you're not working on skill, building subconscious, and if you're not building the self-image that's like you to do this really good, how are you going to beat the guy who's done all that? Right. So that's that's the one that I'm tempted to to dive into and, and write about. In the meantime, while you're waiting on him to write this book, because it could take many years. It's taking me three years to write that one, uh, three years to write the other one. So it could take a little while. But in the meantime, if you're interested in learning the information that he's talking about, give us an email because we will be putting another Training to Win program together soon. Yep. Yeah, we'll definitely have, we'll probably have two a year. Email, we'll do on a webinar. email info at mentalmanagement.com. That's the best way to get us. Yeah, but I really like when I look at the training element stuff. And there's some cool, cool stories that, you know, we hear growing up about training and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, some of the principles that would be shared, it's just like, wow, that, that makes sense. Makes sense. It's mm-hmm. stuff that people normally don't do. You know, like I'll, I'll share my favorite story. Mm-hmm. Okay. So years ago, this is probably, gosh, maybe 12 years ago, dad had two uh, golfers, professional. These mm-hmm. are PGA Tour player golfers. I mean, these, and they've won on tour. I mean, these mm-hmm. aren't guys that are hoping. I mean, these are guys that are already established. Um, one of them had, you know, had uh, one big event, and another one was, you know, like, man, it's been a while since I've won, but they're not your average Joes out there. They're really, really good. Right. And so we were, you know, going through the normal program that dad does, and he gets to one principle, training principle, and two-hour discussion on this one training principle. And I just couldn't believe it. And it was all it was training uh, principle was uh, repetition, mm-hmm. you know, the principle of repetition, and, which basically, to, to sum it up, is if you're doing well, keep on going is kind of what Mm-hmm. the idea is so if you're, you're building well, self-image playing. yeah yeah whatever you're doing if you're if it's going well keep on going so in in my sport and three position rifle shooting we shoot three positions so if i'm shooting standing and i said okay i'm gonna shoot an hour standing then an hour kneeling and then i'm gonna go to the air gun range and shoot an hour of air gun mm-hmm. pretty good half day session in but if i'm shooting really good in standing so if it's like me i if you can shoot around 380 or higher you can be competitive back then it's changed now <laughs> holy cow with well, the scores they shoot now is amazing but anyway if you're shooting around there you it's a you know good practice well what if i'm shooting really good like out of a hundred hundred um, shots a hundred you know ten shots hundreds the the best you can get mm-hmm. well if you're going to average a 380 that means you have to shoot a 97 98 97 98 to get mm-hmm. that average so, well, what if you shoot a 99.98 and you shoot another 99? What are you going to do? Are you going to just stop if the hour's up? According to this principle, you keep shooting because the imprinting power you have into the self-image is huge. Right. And Dad shared a, uh, shares a story about Jack Ryder where Jack would just shoot a ton. Mm-hmm. And you're like, why are you doing that? Because, man, some days you just hold a gun better than others. And it's true. Some days you do. You know, you work with golfers and you ask golfers, it's like, you know, some days you just hit the ball better than others. Yeah, I don't know why, but some days you just hit the ball like I can do no wrong. Other days are a struggle. Well, the idea behind this principle is that when you have that day, imprint that you're doing it right a lot. Right. Okay. So to me, it makes total sense. And so let me take a guess. So these, these tour players had a different idea initially that, oh, well, if it's going good, then I don't need to train it because I already got it. I need to go and train something else. Yeah, it's like, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. I hit my driver five times really well. I'm putting that away because uh-huh. I don't want that mojo to leave, you know, and I'm going to hit another club. And if I'm struggling with my five iron, I'm going to sit out there until I figure it out mm. to correct it. And so... The guy's going great detail how he's training, how he's training. Now, it's been a long time since he's won on tour. Mm-hmm. And we're talking about several years. And he goes on and on. And I'm like, it gets really deep. Mm-hmm. 
And then there's an odd pause. Mm -hmm. And then uh, our dad looks at him and goes, so what you're telling me is you're getting, you're getting really good at being really bad with that five iron. Oh. And the other guy's like, I, th I think he made his point. But the other, the other individual that was talking the story, he goes, I just don't buy into that. And dad's in there said, well, how many tiles have you won recently? Mm -hmm. Now, here's someone that's talking, you know, our father, who has won every big event you could possibly win in his sport. Mm -hmm. And here's a guy that has won at the, at, at, you know, you win a PGA Tour event. It's, it's you, a big you, deal. Yeah, you're not doing it by accident, right? Right. But if it's been 10 years since you've done it and you got someone who basically has done everything they could do in their sport telling you that, hey, you Try might want to do this. And, but this guy was like, no, no, not doing it. And it was a very, very interesting two-hour discussion on that one principle. But after, afterwards, his buddy, he was like, yeah, I could, I could definitely see why that. That might work. That type of training. I could definitely see why that would work because I've got years and years of working on something to fix it. So I've created a habit that's like me to fix things instead of like me to do it well all the time. Mm. Yeah, you run into the guy that can do it well all the time. It's going to be very difficult to beat him. That's really cool. Yeah. And, of course, then he's like, I wish I was here 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah. And so stuff like that where you've got some stories that you could share and I just think it would be powerful for people to see. And there's other training principles that, you know, to us, you know, we heard about growing up. But when you talk to other people in other sports, they're like, yeah, I've never thought about that. Mm -hmm. I never looked at it that way. I hear that a lot. No. How, how can you not train skill and build and protect self image at the same time? That needs to be at the forefront. So if I, if I dive into my next book, it's going to be tackling tackling that issue the other thing is i like short reads so if you notice my, mm -hmm. my both my books are like 100 pages which i value very much because time is difficult to come by to get the time to sit down and read and if you can completely dive in and digest a book in one sitting that's cool one thing i do with this one with attainment is i'll have especially my younger clients read it and then highlight the areas that they need to really remember that maybe they haven't adopted those habits or attitudes yet and the elements here aren't like them yet is to like highlight those things so that they know what they need to work on going forward. And it's very telling for someone who thinks they're doing these things and they think they're in this elite status, but then they read it and they're like, oh, I'm not quite there yet. It's very eye-opening for them. And, and each chapter can be read in any order. Oh, you can just go straight to what you need to read about. Yep. Yeah. And I wanted to do that just because what if I only have 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. Well, then just read one of the chapters in there. What if I'm on an hour and a half plane flight? Well, you can read that an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Where a lot of books that are like two inches thick, you can't read through them. And then I don't like books with a lot of fluff. You know, I had, mm -hmm. I had one book that I came across and I'm reading it. And it's just, it's story after story after story. And some of them were, were good. But it's like, when, when am I going to get to the point, mm -hmm. you know? And I don't, I don't want that. I want stuff that just gets to the point right away. So years ago, someone told me, you need to read Who Moved My Cheese. And I'm like... I love that book. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, okay. So I go to the bookstore and then I buy t this book that's literally that thick uh -huh. for 20 bucks. And I'm like, I'm flipping through this and I'm like, this is... I just spent $20 on this <laughs> thing. And then you start reading it, and it's about, you know, two rats named him and Ha, you know, <laughs> trying to find cheese through this maze or whatever. But when you read through the story, you started realizing these little points that were being made mm -hmm. throughout the story. And the reason why it was a short read and the reason why it was so successful is because there's not a lot of fluff. It's mm -hmm. like, and you're like, why is he telling this fictional story with these rodents mm -hmm. and it's basically because they focus on one thing mm -hmm. and they go for it and you're like wait a minute that's the point right you know is if you're going to go for something you got to focus on it. okay i got it and then they they get to another spot you know and mm -hmm. then they're thinking about this other stuff and so it's it's interesting it was a huge 
seller back in the day mm-hmm. when it fir- first came out. But I remembered that I could sit and read that in one sitting, and it didn't take long, easy read. I'm like, okay, if I'm going to write a book one day, it's going to be like that. Mm-hmm. And the second thing is our granddad, our father's father, told me once, he goes, anytime you read a book, if you can get three good things from it, mm-hmm. it was worth it. Mm-hmm. Anytime you can read a book and get three good things, it was worth it. Writing a book, that to me, writing that book, Attainment, was the hardest thing I ever did. It's easier to set a national record than write that thing. <laughs> I believe it. I believe so, it. So, Because once you put something in print, everybody can criticize it. Mm-hmm. Everybody can. And I used to criticize, you know, oh, I can't believe somebody wrote this and, you know, this is dumb or whatever. Once you put your own effort mm-hmm. into writing a book, you know, I just like, I don't, I have a whole different respect level for authors after going through that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the number one reason why people don't want to write a book. I think everyone's got a book in them too, by the way. Oh, I believe so. You know, but putting it out there on paper and yeah, people can criticize what they want. Or people can praise it too if they want. Mm-hmm. You know, luckily a lot of people like that book and they get a lot out of it mm-hmm. and you get, you know, good praise, but you're not going to please everybody. No. And someone finally told me, uh, something I thought was really, really good. They said, look, 80% of the people probably going to be liking what you do and 20% are going to hate on you. You're doing something right. Mm-hmm. He said, because you can't please everybody. If you if you got 20 people that are just going to not like it, but if 80% like it, then you're doing pretty, you're doing really, really good, which simply is that the majority of people are liking it. And if you look, that's just the way it is and most things are successful, mm-hmm. you know, Look at Coca-Cola and Pepsi. There's a reason why they're dominant what they do because the majority of people like it. If you go, if you want to buy a, a soft drink and it's like, yeah, I want to, I want to, I want a Coke, and they're like, oh no, no, we don't have Coke, we have Pepsi. What are you going to do? Okay, mm-hmm. because most people like both. They like one more than the other, mm-hmm. right? But most people like them. But you have a few, like especially in Texas, you have your diehard Dr. Pepper fans yes. that will never be caught drinking anything but Dr. Pepper. You know, and it's kind of, I think, the same with every every mm-hmm. other avenue, is if you can do something that most people like, well, it's put some on paper and see it. I'm excited to see what's next. I'm excited to find out when you start writing your next book. And it's been a pleasure to talk to you today about attainment for the mind, training to win for those who might want to join us in one of our webinars Thank you for joining us today. Make sure you like and subscribe to this channel so that you can see what's next.